What roll number of all that stuff is there? Take one. I worked as a dressmaker, a sewing machine operator for a number of years. Can you, can you start again? All right. Thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. You had to talk to Susan, not to, to me. Yeah. I know. Oh, okay. oh, I thought you were talking to Susan. No, no. Uh, <clears throat> I worked as a sewing machine operator in the dress trade before the 1933 strike. And that's the big event of the, at least to us, it was the biggest event in the history of the, of the Union and to some extent in the country. I was earning $12 a week as, as a skilled worker and uh, it was a Union shop, which was very insulting to us, but there was no way to enforce the uh, contract. And uh, the Union was, our Union, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union was in pretty bad shape. Uh, three years before, it had been split by the, that time, communists in the Union who tried to take over, and when they failed, they split and organized their own union. And any trade unionist knows that there's nothing worse for labor than two unions in one, in one industry. And things were pretty bad. And I lost that job where I was earning $12 a week. Uh, and uh, the union was in as bad shape as the individuals. I remember Mr. Zimmerman saying to us, manager of Local 22 of the ILG, that we must pay our telephone bill because if the phone doesn't answer, then there's really no union as far as the world was concerned. And there was a very decent union up to the time of 1926. Uh, that's a little back further than I go, but I was aware, and... Um, Can I ask you to describe, what did your shop look like? Mm -hmm. And how many people were in it, and how much did dresses sell for? Yeah. The... Um, with our history of the Triangle Fire back in 1909, the sh our factories, and, and then there was a, a big drive to clean up literally to, to clean up and have better, cleaner uh, workrooms. Uh, the industry had a, a record of high uh, percentage of TB among its patients, among its, <laughs> its workers, and uh, there was, had been a great effort made to keep the shops clean. And even at that time, they were, they were in pretty fair conditions as far as the physical plant was concerned. But uh, <clears throat> making a living, that was an altogether different story. And uh, in the Deep Depression, I want to tell you about a couple of miracles that produced our 1933 strike. First, things were so bad that one of the managers of the union made an appointment with the manager of the union, who was the leader of the split away forces because by that time, there was a split in the Communist Party and a fight against Stalin, and they expelled a large group of members, including myself. I was a member of the Young Communist League. And uh, so this manager of the, uh, that time, Local 22 ILG, Mr. Bluestein, uh, asked somebody to invite him and Mr. Zimmerman, who was from the breakaway union, but now expelled from the party, uh, to meet, and he said to him, you know, you have no union and we have no union, and times are very bad. Come back to us. Let's work together. And that's a very rare thing in any fight. And so we did. I think all the ten of us or nine went back to the union, but it did mean that much that there was not unity all around, but at least a number of the forces working together. Can I give you the um, digress just a little bit from that? Can you tell me just a little bit about your neighborhood, okay? It will be in sequence, but all right. I was 12 years old when I came here, born in the Ukraine, refugee. I'm sorry, in, refugee. in 1933, can you um, start in 33? Tell us who lived there. I haven't even thought about that. Oh, yeah. Came to the Depression, and with $12 a week, 
only when there was work, you could hardly pay the rent. So my husband and I moved into my mother's apartment, and so did every other couple or person. We just didn't have money to pay the rent. A uh, big problem about money for food, and I borrowed eight and a half dollars for my sister, no less. And um, she asked me for it back. By then, I guess I had a job. I had holes in my shoes like Stevenson. Do you remember the, the, uh, the pin showing Stevenson's shoes? Only he was a busy man. We had holes in our shoes because we didn't have money to, to have them repaired. And uh, when you got a job, you repaired your shoes. You didn't make enough to buy a new pair. And it was pretty awful. Uh, the union did the same as we did individually about rent. It had been a fairly good union, though not anything like as big as what happened after the strike. But there were a number of headquarters. Local 22 had its own, and then there was the dressmakers joint board made up of four locals that had another loft in the arcade building between 33rd and 4th. And when we didn't have any more rent to pay, as, as soon as any lease was up, that group, that local, would move in with another one. And then when the, uh, when the strike came and the, the headquarters in the arcade, one flight over the Chinese restaurant, we were literally frightened that the building would cave in. There were such crowds as we never, never believed. Nobody had any idea how many people worked in the dress industry. And we very quickly got out of there. By that time, we could pay the rent. Now, can, can you tell me, how did work conditions get worse during the Depression? The dressmakers had made a very fine living, from what I know, before the Depression. Um, in 1922, we got the eight-hour day, and my older sister was a dressmaker. And by golly, our American cousins couldn't believe she was earning $70 and more a week. And then things just went down, down, and down. And I guess everybody's aware of the 1929 crash. I don't think any of our members committed suicide, but many bankers and business people jumped out of windows, sixth floor, eighth floor. It, it, was, it was frightening, truly frightening. Were there more sweatshops during the Depression? When people make little money, originally the sweatshops, and that goes back to 1910 and more. Uh, okay, we can just bump ahead to the Depression. And yeah, the, 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 um, the, the sweatshops were <clears throat> where people worked 12, 14 hours a day. The stories are that some of them just went to sleep on the bundles of cloth and woke up and went back to work. And that's when we built, when the Workman's Circle, which is a fraternal order, built a TB sanitarium. And the story is told about a medical conference, an international medical conference, and what, what do you do to prevent TB? And a socialist doctor got up and said, abolish the terrible working conditions. Cloth, as it's cut, it creates a great deal of dust. And if you're in that dust, and, and the, I guess the Board of Health wasn't after them at that time, to keep the um, factories clean. In my day, the floor was swept every day religiously. It wasn't even anything we had to fight about. And the, the inside of the factory wasn't that bad anymore. That fight was made before, but there was very little work, and the competition was so bad. And the industries organized in such peculiar fashion. You have jobbers who don't employ any workers, just a designer, perhaps, and maybe a cutter. And they send their work to be, dresses to be sewn into contracting shops. So if you organized the contractors' workers, the jobbers wouldn't give them any work. And you couldn't strike the job because he didn't employ any workers. That was a development when they began to make fairly cheap dresses. Like, I worked in a factory where we made what we called 375 dresses. 
That was a dress that would sell to the store for three seventy-five, and then maybe to the customer um, close to double, like six dollars. <clears throat> and it was a time when the money still had, I guess, that much value because the same garments years later cost a great deal more. But that's an industry problem. But organizing was difficult because of the way the industry is organized and because in a depression when jobs are so rare uh, it, people won't easily come out on strike but we did have a strike in 1930 and it our people went out on strike and we settled they went back to work but the feeling was that the union agreement had very little validity because of the structure and the fact that times were so bad now, can you tell me that story? Um, about to, uh, oh, relax. Relax. <clears throat> okay. Just hey, Chris? Good. Now I'd like a drink. Yeah, Chris. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So sharing. Mm -hmm. Sharing this lunch. So we waited to get a job to fix our shoes and to have money for lunch. And the automat was the big thing in those days and quite the cheapest. And I was a vegetarian, but I didn't know enough English to know that clam chowder was not for vegetarians. So I put my coins in, got my soup, and then recognized that it isn't kosher. I didn't know what kind of uh, meat it had in it, but I didn't eat it and went hungry the whole day. And generally, uh, People used, used to bring a sandwich with them. It's cheaper at home to make it at home even than even in the automat. And uh, the union was a, a magnet. Whether we worked or not, we, we would meet and sort of commiserate with each other. And then if somebody had money to buy a sandwich, he'd split it with another one who didn't. I think perhaps at present, some people are beginning to understand what that kind of thing was, but this being my first depression, it, it, you, you, your hopes sink so low that you don't think you're ever going to come up again. And it's a terrible, terrible, terrible feeling. I don't think anybody understands it, or I did, before it really happened to me. You, you, you feel worthless and stupid and and useless. It, it's an awful, awful way to feel. However, in that terrible time, the somehow a number of the union people got together, those who partook in the in the split, and uh, we said we we just have to get together and build a union. And this is how we built. In Brownswell, there was a union office, a branch office. And so we called the forum through the press, the Jewish. Of course, I was in the local 22, which was practically all Jewish at that point. And then there was the Italian local, which was 89. And I'm not as acquainted with their inner workings, but I'm sure they weren't far different. So we called an open forum through the press. And people came to a meeting, a great number of them. We were quite surprised. And we tried to raise each other's morale and, and think in terms of, uh, we asked people to join the union, probably didn't have money to pay their dues. But there was a bit of the spirit raised. We, we met in Brooklyn, we, in Brownsville, which is Brooklyn, and other parts, and then in the Bronx. And it was sort of like uh, trying to think of the light when you're in a very dark room and scared. It, it helped to get together with others and to feel that you're making some attempt to influence those conditions. And then came the, uh, then Roosevelt, Roosevelt was elected. And in as much as most of us, the unions at that time were built by socialists who, who were different from the communists, but those that were socialists before the communist regime and Stalin, they were very decent people who, who got together to, to better their conditions, to build unions. And uh, 
so we did. And within the union itself, well, within, can you jump ahead to the National Recovery yeah, Administration? Within, and, and can you even tell me, how did you as a worker feel when the NRA was passed? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's hard to b believe it now, but it was true. Most of the Jewish trade unions, uh, trade union leaders in the needle trades were socialist or agreed with the socialists. They didn't need, need to be especially active, but uh, that's the way they thought. And politically, they wouldn't vote for either capitalist party. And uh, the Communist Party used to run a slate, the Socialist Party used to run a slate, Norman Thomas ran for president any number of times, and, and that's... I'm sorry, we're not actually going to be covering the election, we're covering after the election. So the National Recovery Act. Uh -huh. okay. okay. So if you can... And in all this darkness in, of feeling in the trade unions, uh, when Roosevelt was elected, it was, a, it, it was like, and it, it actually was, a rebirth. It was a, almost enough for a president of this great nation to take account of us foreigners, which is what all of the union members were, practically without any exception, and uh, acknowledge that, that things are bad and that workers are permitted to organize. I was arrested twice for being on the picket line in the days when there were injunctions issued against picket lines and strike. Uh, and here was somebody, not somebody, the President of the United States saying, it's okay, you can organize. We were told that other picket lines carried pictures of Roosevelt. We didn't quite do that. But um, the, the government set up I guess the Labor Board, the NRA was issued, National Labor Relations Act, and, um, and they suggested, organized, I don't remember exactly how, but they got the industries, not just our own, but we were the biggest industry in the city and in the state, to get together the employers and the labor leaders to write a code for the industry. And the code said we would have the 40-hour week. Of course, during the Depression, nobody knew how long you worked. If you had anything to do and you were asked, I remember being told to, to hint, uh, winked at to get up away from my machine after 7 o'clock because the law prohibited women from working after 7 o'clock. So here we are. Um, the, the, uh, both sides, the employers and the workers, and the feeling was very high against the employers, obviously, uh, to sit down and write a code for the industry. And that would be part of the law, which was, I guess, a revolution. I don't know how else I could, I could explain that. And, um, and as I said, we didn't walk with, with signs of Roosevelt, but he was on everybody's lips. And he, he was the Messiah. He led us out of the wilderness. Now, how did you want to be treated that you didn't know? Let me ask a different question first. Um, um, why was the timing so important? Yeah. And, and why was this the perfect moment to go on strike? In our small union, in our small shrunken union, and this is, again, the, the Jewish labor group in New York. Uh, they were leading people in the union. Uh, the communists had left with, and, and never came back. Not, that's right, never. They had to come back and join individually, but that's another story. They, um, in our leadership, were represented socialists of the right and the left, Zionists and labor Zionists, and um, I'm trying to think who else. And of course, the Lovestonites. We, we, we were the group that had been expelled from the Communist Party and went back to work in the ILG. And those people were able to work together so well that it amazes me to this day because when people are organized, they organize because they're fighting other people. And here, these labor people had enough sense and enough goodwill toward each other that they were able to work together. 
Now, <clears throat> in, the union, in the industry at that time, there was the busy season, the longer season, and the shorter season. The shorter season was very short. Um, and union contracts, even though they weren't worth very much, were always written in the longer season. And the NRA came out, <clears throat> whatever, June, July. By August, uh, Mr. Zimmerman, who seemed to appraise the situation better than anybody, said, this is the time for us to strike. A and here we were without money to pay the telephone bill. Uh, and the other said to him, uh, but this is the short season. And we got an agreement still in force, to which he said, you show me any, any shop, any factory we have an agreement with, and I'll show you that they've broken the, um, the agreement. And uh, he said, if we don't strike now, we may not have another chance. And uh, if we win, we'll have, no, we'll have no problems. Now, why was this the perfect moment? Because of, because, and, and. Tell me it was the perfect moment because. Yeah, it was, this was the perfect moment. At, and he saw it at that time, later everybody agreed, because the NRA was just issued. And you might think it was prophetic of him to know that the NRA would be ruled unconstitutional. Uh, but that, that, there was the feeling in the air. It was, the only other thing I can compare to it is when the end of the Second World War, when Eisenhower came down on 7th Avenue back from the, from back victorious. What was that feeling in the air? Can you describe that? That was it. <laughs> what, what was the, like, can you put words yeah. to it? It was, um, we suddenly, we suddenly began to, to see some light in all this terrible darkness of individual privation. It, it, it's a thing that, that isn't, isn't appreciated enough, I think, even by the psychiatrists. Uh, you're just, you're just feeling lower than, than low. It, 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 you, you, you have no hope, you have no energy. Anything you do, you do just. So, I went off on a tangent. <clears throat> Okay, you can start. I'm trying to think where. So, with all of these people, with all the different opinions, they came to agree that it was proper and, and that we had a strike while the iron was hot. And we decided to go on strike. And the active ones, I was a member of the executive board at the time, we got up five o'clock that morning. I guess we couldn't sleep anyway. And uh, we, we reported to the union office to pick up this wonderful strike call in red, general strike. And we had to be out on the street with the strike call as people were coming in to work. And some wouldn't even go up. Usually you call a strike for 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, and. Uh, there were a couple of halls in, in Manhattan that the union used in previous strike situation. They're not here anymore. One was Webster Hall and one was, time I forgot Brian. it, <laughs> Bryan Hall. Can you say them together? Yeah. There was, one was Webster Hall on 40, 40th, sorry. One was Webster Hall and the other was Bryan Hall. But this day, even though we felt we made the right decision and we were going along with the, with the tide, <clears throat> there were just so many thousands of people, it was unbelievable, it was unbelievable. We had no notion how, how many people worked in the industry, because the union, even in the best times, had been a small union of the higher priced garments, because there the skill was, skill was higher and, and those people, and, and the Profits were higher, so they were able to get a, um, a better price. But those were so few that I later wondered how they were able to have a union at all when there were so many not organized. Well, that day they just came and came and came, and we had to, we asked City Hall to give us a place to put our strikers. And, I'm sorry, the wind is banging stuff, so we need... 
the mood. Okay, you can start. You want about distribution, or, or did you um, get that? Um, I'll come back to that, but just the mood. The, the leaflet, I mean. And so we were taking this gamble, and the day came of the strike, and uh, we, the active ones, the members of the executive board, and what little tiny staff of paid offices there was at the time, we reported to the office 6 o'clock that morning, took our leaflets of this beautiful call for general strike, and got out on the street to distribute at the subway stations. And, and there is an area that is called the dress market. And there are markets for other industries. But that's where, you know, that's sort of our territory. And that's where dressmakers gather. And people just wouldn't even go up to work. And the street was full of people. It must have been a nice sunny day. That's how it, I remember. And uh, the two strike halls that we used before, uh, they, 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 they couldn't house a tenth of the people that were coming out. And so the union, always in good terms with the city administration, uh, as far back as I remember, and I guess further, this was a union town. The, the city workers are organized, and they always had a favorable attitude toward us. Uh, the, garment industry. And so our people appealed to, to City Hall to give us a place to meet. And they gave us the 71st Regiment Armory on Park Avenue and 34th Street. Now there's a, a good high school in its place called Norman Thomas, Norman Thomas High School. And um, it, it, it comes back to me how we were the workers lived either, our workers lived either in the Bronx or in various parts of Brooklyn. I don't think anybody lived in Manhattan. And they knew the way by subway from their home to their factory or to the union office, which were all in the same area. And here, I, I remember once coming to the east side by taking the wrong train instead of the west side and being completely lost. I had never seen that part of the city. I mean, east of Fifth Avenue didn't exist, or, or of Sixth. And here we are asking thousands of people to come to Park Avenue and 34th Street. And we hope they wouldn't lose their way. And, and it's sort of symbolic of how everything changed. And we spread out and got to know more of Manhattan, New York, as we called it. The boroughs were, we didn't, we didn't consider, that was Brooklyn. And um, the worst place to try to hold meetings is in an armory, but we didn't complain. And it, it was a whirlwind of a week. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Uh, everybody was getting acquainted with everybody, and it, it, was, it was just a great big holiday. I've got, to, I've got to add this. There was a sound truck outside the armory by the communist union saying to people, as we were getting close to the settlement, the strike only lasted a week, saying to them, don't believe your leaders, they're traitors. You will get nothing like what they tell you in the factories. And that's all. I don't think they gave them another out. It was one of those completely crazy out of time and out of place uh, uh, situations. And the amazing thing, one more of the miracles, is that nobody paid any attention to them. Absolutely none. Okay. And these were people who hadn't had touch with the union, maybe never heard of it, and maybe heard and heard negative things about it. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell me what was the importance of the strike? So what how, did it do? Oh, oh well, we went from there. I'm sorry. So all of us, all the executive board members, including myself, we were in the armory holding meetings with individual um, shops uh, uh, workers and telling them, I, 
what the union is and what will happen to them and why they should join. And you would think that they already knew because they came. The, the genius of the NRA was that the employers told them to go and join the union because of the way this thing was run, which was just, just unbelievable. I wish, I wish you were here again. Uh, that for the employers to, to be organized and to have some kind of contact with each other and, and uh, do away with some of the cutthroat competition, this was the whole package, the employers and the contractors, which was part of our industry, and the union. The workers came through the union. What did the union get out of, um, out of the, the strike? Now, we not only got back what we had had, which wasn't being uh, uh, no, observed by anybody, we got the 35-hour week. And being young enough, and there were others that felt that you, you, you just couldn't resist this, this fantastic time and the feeling that you had a part in it, that you were doing this to better the conditions, which meant mostly pay because, as I said, shops were not in such terrible bad shape. And I remember myself thinking that, well, I remembered as a child when the, the eight-hour day came into being, and now we were getting the, the 30, that was the 40-hour week, and now the 35-hour week, and I could just see it rolling across the continent to, to the Pacific, and that all of industry was going to step up to, to this wonderful uh, uh, position of being in, in, in control of, of your wages. You, you can talk to an employer without worrying you're going to be fired for it. That was our first uh, amendment, <laughs> our first condition. Uh, a worker had to put in a one-week trial period to assure the employer that his work was suitable. And after that, he couldn't be fired for the life of the agreement except for something like theft or whatever. What was the Jewish saying that you were telling me about, about the 35-hour oh, week? Oh, yes. Can you tell me that and explain it? Now, it, it's uh, the, the dress industry is mostly an industry of women, but there are, and there were then, a number of men. And for some of them who had come from Tsarist Russia, 35 hours was kind of peculiar. And in Yiddish, they'd say, 35 little hours? What are we going to do? Go home and fight, quarrel with the wife? <laughs> and for, uh, for, for the women and the activists, it, it, was, it was just great. We had no problem what we do with the time. There were evening classes and even, evening dramatic groups. Out of one, uh, Pins and Needles developed, gave a White House performance, went to Broadway for years. They're still playing it now and then. Uh, and the, all, of the, all of the actors were members of the union who did this as an evening recreational activity. I'm sorry, we ran out yeah. of film. We just rolled out. Okay. okay. That was wonderful. What were the wobblies? Um, to be, okay. to have a good word said for them. Can you tell me about LaGuardia's support for organized labor? Well, that's, he, he got the bill against injunctions passed when he was in Congress. So that goes back. How about in New York to? City and during his early administration? Do you remember anything? Well, he was just a good guy. I, and we never had bad, we never had bad relations with City Hall, really. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons we were able to put this, these buildings up, too, to this day. Mm -hmm. They're 30 years old, <laughs> not this day, but. Do you remember any um, like positive things that happened with LaGuardia during his first couple of years? He was just a lot of fun. I really don't okay. remember. Okay. He used to read the comics over. The, well, there was a right. news strike, so read, that's the kind of yeah. thing. Not I, that we didn't take him seriously, but, but I, th that was the kind of thing. And then a man came in who looked exactly like him, dressed in a big, what, how many gallon hats do the Texans wear? 
and he, he was walking up City Hall, the steps, and I think that's when LaGuardia saw him. And he was furious, which everybody was amazed at. But he was that kind of guy. He ran to all the fires. But these are the silly things you remember. You know? he, he, he swept corruption out of City Hall and Tammany, Tammany Hall. Oh, you're not in New York. <laughs> but you've heard of Tammany Hall. Am I talking? Mm -hmm, yes, keep going. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I, um, can you tell me about your neighborhood? Let's go back to that. Oh. The different immigrant groups that left there, who came when, um, mostly in the 30s, okay? Anything to tell? You're throwing me off. Okay. If I say, <laughs> if I say when we came to, I think I'll do it right. Okay. Strangely, I was 12 years old when we came here, and my uncle, who owned a grocery store and a um, large back room of the grocery store, which was meant for stock, and uh, this, um, whatever, two-family wooden house in East New York on Montauk and Blake Avenues. And since my mother came here a widow with five daughters, only two old enough to go to work, uh, we set up house in the back store, back room of the, of my uncle's grocery store. It was a large room, so we had two double beds, and we had a table with enough chairs for um, to sit down, and have a meal, and a stove, and I remember an iron sink, uh, t for which my uncle apologized, because everybody was having uh, uh, white sinks. And my mother laughed. We, where we came from, in this small uh, Jewish town in the Ukraine, not only was there no sewage, there was no, no kind of plumbing, and the water carrier brought you water for a fee. You told me that your neighborhood here looked like a shtetl, or yeah. felt like a shtetl. What, yeah, did you, what do you mean by that? I'm getting right there. And this was such luxury, you, you turn the faucet, the, the, the handle, and you, you got running water, and they were apologizing to her. But in many ways, uh, America, New York, Could is a big good, place. I'm oh, sorry, this is Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. I remember one of the questions we were asked over and over is, how do you like America? And at the age of 12, I thought that was so silly. <laughs> I mean, what did we know of America? What do you, how, how can you say what do you think of a country? But I guess people were a little clumsy about those things. But in many ways, it wasn't that different for us. In our town, we didn't have a restaurant. We, we didn't have a hotel. Well, there was a, whatever, an inn for, for, for people who came in by wagon to sleep over one night usually. Uh, it was a very lovely, quiet uh, uh, area, East New York was. There was not a hotel, there was not a restaurant. I think there was not, I'm quite sure there was not a doctor. And uh, the houses were no more than two stories high, maybe three. And the mix was, and it was so normal and natural that I, I sometimes long for it, was largely populated by Jewish people, but also Italians and also blacks. And it all seemed perfectly normal and natural. People lived in harmony. You went to the grocery, you went to the candy store. And a lot of them, I might say, <laughs> unless they worked in the garment industry, probably never left. It was much later that they built one of the great movie theaters there. Uh, and uh, it just it just wasn't that it just wasn't that that different that part of us. What was different was that we weren't afraid. Of course, I personally was, and I would never say no to an adult. And my aunt asked me to go out in the evening to walk three blocks to get something in a drugstore because that one was open late. And my heart was beating a mile a minute all the way there and back. You did not go out at night where we came from because of the war and the revolution and, and the pogrom. It, there, there was just no normal time. But other than that, uh, it, it, was, it was really not that big a step. 
And uh, I want to get back to the, to the strike. From all that terrible gloom, uh, people went back to work after one week strike and earned 75 and $80 a week. We, the active people, were told to stay on because you couldn't possibly process so many people in one week. And they all, of course, joined the union. And so just as soon as the strike was called and a shop would come in, uh, the people from the shop, we would uh, write up a, a role for that factory, so, and then we would check it off that they come in. This was because of old habits. You wanted to make sure nobody snuck out and went to work. But I guess there was no danger of it here. But we did need the records, and it took time to process them. And um, every, every dressmaker had to have a union card. And so we stayed on uh, for a week longer. And I don't remember whether we were paid 20 or $25 for that week. They didn't really have the guts to ask us to work for nothing. <laughs> Okay. which all of the union activity for the active people was always a uh, um, volunteer. Yes, they used, we used to get paid $1 for supper for the evening when we had an executive board. But of course, a lot of us were above that. We wouldn't, we wouldn't accept the dollar either. And so that was what we were paid that week to stay that additional week to get the records in order and, and to just send people back to work. Okay, can, thank you. Can I yeah. jump to a different part? Can yeah. you tell me, um, you told me what false pot roasts were. Can you, a false pot roast? When oh, you, well, that goes back to the Ukraine. You want that? Yeah. We're out. No, no, oh, no, 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 oh, no, I'm no. sorry. Um, oh, it's the Ukraine. I thought it was during the Depression. Well, depression, I was on my own, had nothing to eat, but my mother didn't cook. Right. Can you, can you explain what, um, that you made pot roast and what it is? That'd be great. All right. Are we on? Yes. My mother was a great cook, and we had very bad times, but we never felt we were poor, which is a little difficult to understand. You've got to take my word for it. Uh, when, when there was no, no money for food, for, for much food, uh, my mother would say she'll cook a false pot roast. So you say, what can be false about a pot roast? She'd cut the potatoes in different kind of chunks, I guess that looked more like chunks of meat, and cook them in a nice thick brown gravy. And that was a meal. And there's a whole lesson to be learned there of, of how you approach um, poverty and problems, and if I may venture an opinion, I think that if once you were doing well, it is easier to sort of keep the, keep up the front and hope for better times. Must be a lot worse for people who, who are born in poverty. They, they have nothing to look back to uh, for better times like we did in the Union. Um, okay. Can you also tell me one other thing that you, in the pre-interview you were saying during the Depression, we had no backbone. We couldn't stand oh, I up did. straight. I did. And, um, I did that. Not quite in those words. Oh, and but also we, we did the, quite a bit. the Jewish saying about if everybody has the same oh, yeah. problem. So would you mm -hmm. mind giving that back? Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> a great part, I guess, of, I was going to say mental health or whatever, is in how your, your, your parents perceive bad times and you learn from them. And it can, it, it can make a lot of difference. Now, <clears throat> there's a good Hebrew saying that when you're part of a large disaster, your own personal part isn't as hard to bear. And, um, and I guess time does help to heal things. Not completely, but it does. Can you give me the, the, um, the Yiddish saying and then the translation of it? That's a little hard. Maybe I can get uh -huh. it. Um, it's a Hebrew saying, Suris Rabim Chutzen Achuma, which is saying that if there's a general disaster, a flood, a pogrom, or the war, that if, if a whole group is in it, 
the individual hurt what the proverb says is is hair is cut in half and every time i read about mudslide with school children kids It, it feels so awful not to be able to find work when you wanted and not having money for anything you needed, including a pair of shoes. I don't think I owned more than one pair of shoes at a time for years and years. And um, I got even later, bought more shoes, but it was pretty awful. And um, in addition to losing the material things, because you don't have money to pay for them, including food, it doesn't seem right to me, but I know that that's what it did to me. I mean, I, I don't think people should feel guilty if, if they can't find work. But I remember how terrible, terribly I felt. Um, it's like you, you lose your voice. You, you, you internalize it. You, you, you don't think that, you're, that anything you say has much validity. You don't argue for your point of view. And um, you, 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 so, you sort of hunch down. You're, you don't walk as erect. And it, it, it is so humiliating. And it's as if everybody looks down on you except that is what makes it a little easier to bear when you got your friends in the same position. Uh, but we all felt like that. I don't remember that we blamed anybody. We were just so miserable that we couldn't do anything to, to improve our condition. We did, things were so bad that that's when I think welfare was beginning to be paid for the first time. For most part, people sold apples in the street. That was the way they were supposed to um, live through the Depression. But we, we were a proud bunch. And I remember that, say, Mr. Zimmerman and Mr. Bluestein, they went to the city and they demanded or asked for some kind of work for us. And they, in those days, there were dresses that were called house dresses. And they were paid by the dozen. They were sort of glorified aprons. And they weren't hung up on a rack in the store. They were folded, and that's how you bought them. And it was way beneath our dignity. I mean, we were skilled dressmakers. And only because, I guess, our people wouldn't let up, they sent us to work in one of these house dress factories. And if that didn't take your dignity away, I don't know what would. But we worked, and we got paid for our work. And it couldn't have been much. I don't remember what it was. But that was falling pretty low except for no work at all. So the union leaders, those I mentioned, and others, and the active people, we got in on that uh, uh, project. And it was, it was an, ordinary, um, an ordinary garment factory, only they were making those garments. It wasn't in, in the same uh, uh, way as, as the um, artists that were given work to paint and the others. But I, I did get in on the FERA project, which preceded the NRA. That was a trial balloon. They just had to do something before all these people lie down and die. And they, uh, uh, the government organized this FERA, Federal Emergency. That was the one with the Relief Association. And what that offered was re um, review. It's another word for it. A, a review for teachers and um, counselors uh, to refresh their, uh, it really made no sense, but the important thing was you got paid $18 a week. So. Can we cut? Yeah.
<laughs> we're getting involved. Yes, no, this is, I think we yeah. want this. Okay, how about you? Uh, those hungry days seem to have lasted forever. And um, I guess none of us sold apples, which was supposed to be uh, the way to um, pull yourself out of the depression. But uh, I participated in this FERA uh, a project, which was uh, a program to um, let teachers and counselors who perhaps haven't taught in a long time to take this refresher course. And the only thing that had any meaning is that we were getting paid and I hadn't been a teacher, but they took me anyway. And it, it, uh, it wasn't as good as getting a job, but by golly, it paid for your groceries, and groceries were very cheap. I remember borrowing a dollar from my sister who came to visit because I wanted to go down to grocery and buy something I could feed her and myself with. And it was one of the worst moments in my life to, to to borrow, we, one of our traditions, my family anyway, was not to borrow. And to it. this day, I have not got loans. The only loan I made was to pay <clears throat> in for the apartment that I live in. And I thought that, well, even if I die, um, the apartment's there. I, I, I won't die a debtor. Okay, can you tell me how, did you feel that, that this federal program bailed you out personally? Can you just, can you say yeah. how you felt? So, uh, you, some of us still had our sense of humor. Some of us committed suicide. It was so tough on people. But uh, uh, those of us in the trade seemed to have made it. And so I had worked on a relief project making house dresses and then I was taking a Hi. refresher. I'm sorry, the sorry. siren. <laughs> the importance of that relief to you. So, enough to put new soles on the shoes and uh, eat a home-cooked meal that had something besides potatoes in it. Uh, uh, these... <clears throat> These things help, but they were all for short periods of time. It isn't as if you can go on this work project and stay on it for a year. And so when that gave out, you were back where you started from, but you didn't sink quite so low. It, uh, I guess you always feel it some, sometimes got to blow over. And my uncle told us when we came here and everything seemed so good as far as making a living was concerned, was that but the 1907 there was such a terrible depression that that's one of the the holes in the capitalist system you I'm go sorry. along for a long time and okay. then okay can you tell us about your friend's yeah. sister so, okay thank you my closest friend is in addition to having to feed herself had a sister who was a single mother with a child and uh, it 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 just it just happened that way and so she decided to, to ask for welfare. And when they set up this welfare thing, they had, they, they appointed um, investigators and then people who were in charge of the investigators, and you had a whole new bureaucracy. And um, after agonizing over this, uh, uh, she finally decided that she would go on, on relief. And so our friend who, worked in the administration with the investigator, said to her, I'll tell you when I'll send an investigator to you and uh, have cabbage cooking. I guess that was the great uh, um, sign of poverty. And uh, she, got on, she got on welfare. How did she and feel about that? Can you refer to it as FERA and not welfare? No, no, it wasn't FERA. FERA was, was home, this... Home Relief it was. Home Relief. Okay, can you refer to it as Home Relief? That's right, Thank I you. didn't remember that. Okay. Yeah. So I had one friend <clears throat> on Home Relief. We, we were a very sad lot. And uh, 
that's why the, the NRA and the strike in 1933 was, was from hell to heaven. It, it was, when I think of it now, it, it still sounds so dramatic. It still feels so dramatic. And that's how things went. How did your friend feel about being on home relief? Uh, whether we worked on a relief project or my friend who was on home relief, it is, it is a terrible way to feel about yourself when you know, when for the first time in your experience, it wasn't enough to want to go to work. You, you wanted to and you tried and, and, um, and they, they, just, they just weren't any jobs. And it makes you feel pretty small. You, you, you wish you had somebody to put your head on and cry, or your head on, on somebody's lap. Did she feel bailed out at the same time, like rescued by this? Can you describe any of that? And the story of the cabbage? She told that. OK, we're going to have to roll okay. out. We're going to have to reload another magazine. Wait a sec. Uh, the following is Wild Sound. This is Room Tone for the interview with Jenny Silverman, Wild Sound. 